All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the February Toronto Java User Group. Just our usual slide here for housekeeping. We have a mailing list, we have a Google Plus community, uh, we have a meetup group, so you can join all of those and follow us and comment and rate things and get involved. And uh, the gateway to all of that is tjug.ca. So just hit there and there's links to everything. We also record all of these meetings and you can check out our videos. There's links to them all there. They're on YouTube. Some of them are on, on Vimeo still. But they're all available for viewing. So Java news this month. There wasn't very much. Um, there were some new releases from Groovy, which is their first releases since the pivotal Groovy breakup announcement. Uh, it was mostly just a bug fix release, but um, quite a few changes. And Groovy is trying to figure out how to move their project underneath the foundation, like Eclipse Foundation or Apache Foundation. And they want to keep their license and not really compromise the project, but move under some sort of um, more structured foundation. And uh, Kosuki has got, uh, he's, the, he's the Jenkins guy. He's got a bunch of comments about it on his, on his blog and what he thinks Groovy should do. And it's worth, worth reading. So these slides will appear on the on our website, so you don't have to write down these links. Um, there's a new release of Jersey, which is the first one in a little while, which is just bug fixes, um, a couple critical memory leaks. So if you've been using Jersey heavily in your products, they m you may have noticed that it sort of leaks heap like nobody's business. <laughs> um, but they've done a huge, huge improvement in the last little while. There's also been some news with HTTP2, uh, which is the, the hot new thing for the web, which is trying to reduce latency. Um, Google has pulled out their speedy project. They've, they say they're going to remove it from Chrome and are completely backing this instead. And so they, everybody should be using it. Um, so it's got interesting features where a web server can, can push content at the browser even before the browser asks for it. So if you have a page with CSS and JavaScript and all of that stuff, the server can push it all before the, the browser has to make several requests. Um, and it's coming in Java, and that will be one of the first server implementations. So it's promised in Jetty 9.3, and apparently some of the websites that deal with Jetty, Jetty are already running HTTP2. And Servlet 4 is going to support the HTTP 2 features as well in the new EE spec. So that's kind of Java out ahead a little bit on that one, I think. And that's all I found this month for news. Does anybody have anything else? Any interesting releases or? Uh, Android App Studio had a new release this month <coughs> as well. I believe Google's announced the next Google I.O. conference. Oh, OK. When's, when is that? I forget the date. <laughs> Usually they get uh, usually Google I/O. They're claim to fame as you get a freebie. Like last year, it was Android Wear watches. Oh, that's Android right. Yeah. So. Actually, our conference calendar has vanished from this deck. We usually have a conference calendar. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway. Oh, um, another release. I release an alpha of my game card. Like <laughs> oh yeah. So. Or <laughs> the, the floor is always open for a five-minute talk. So. You want to show us your game? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll bring in my laptop and we'll play it next time. All right. Awesome. <laughs> so, and uh, our our speaker next with the uh, to carry extensions for Apache Maven, Igor. All right. So before I talk about my talks, how many of you are using Maven? All right. Quite a few. <laughs> how many of you are writing Maven plugins? Okay. Better than nobody. And <laughs> anyone uses M2 Eclipse? All right. So what I will talk about today is uh, Takari life uh, sorry, extensions to Maven lifecycle. So before I... So th the talk will be structured, basically. There are three parts of it. First, I will give a quick overview of uh, what Takari lifecycle life is. Then I will... <coughs> explain uh, our extensions to 
compiler plugin, right? So we have some what I believe advanced features in our compiler implementation, compiler plugin implementation. And the last section will be talking about development tools that we use to work on Takara lifecycle itself, and the same tools can be used to work on any Maven plugin that you develop. So before I start uh, explaining what Takara lifecycle is, I guess I need to explain what Maven lifecycle is, because although many people use Maven, I from my experience, not many actually know what lifecycle <laughs> means in, in uh, Maven terminology. So lifecycle is actually just a list of name, named build phases, right? There isn't much more to it. Yes, go ahead. Can you just speak up a little bit? Uh, <coughs> if, if you don't mind. Thank All right, I'll try, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so Maven core itself defines just three life cycles. Right, there is clean life cycle that is invoked when you run MVN clean from common line. There is default life cycle when you run pretty much everything else. And there is also site life cycle that uh, I actually never use myself, so I don't know what it's used for. <laughs> <laughs> so can you hear me all right now? <laughs> and uh, so what actually happens during the build is defined by uh, something called packaging type. So default packaging type that uh, projects get uh, when you create like standard form without explicitly telling what packaging type to use is jar packaging type, right? And it tells that it needs to use Maven compiler plugin, sorry, Maven compiler plugin to, to use this, uh, <coughs> Maven resources plugin to copy resources and uh, process them. Right, it uses jar plugin to create jar file, it uses deploy plugin to deploy uh, the results to your repository. So what we've done, we created alternative implementation of the default lifecycle that tar targets the same Java space, right, but with uh, some, as I said, advanced features that do not exist in, in standard uh, default lifecycle implementation. So why we did that, right? So our primary goal was basically threefold. So we wanted to have proper incremental build behavior. So when you rerun your build without any changes, we expect to get exactly the same result as, as during the previous build. Right? If that happened to be successful build, you get the same jar. If it happens to be the, like a failed build, you should get the same set of exceptions or error messages rather. Right? And if you make a small change to your project, right? let's say you changed uh, just one uh, Java source, we expect just one source to be recompiled and then just minimal amount of work necessary to, to create the same output as, as you'd expect. So the second uh, goal was idempotency. potency. Right? So we aren't there yet, but what we want to be able to do when you rebuild the same thing from either the same computer or other build system, right? we expect to get or would like to get byte-to-byte -byte identical output. Right? And uh, this is important for us because when you have a you know, really large-scale project, like thousands of modules, right, each build will have only small delta. Right? And we want to be able to do delta deployment we want to eventually get to continuous release and delivery where actually all on this like smallest possible amount of work is done not only during the build but during deployment as well <coughs> and we also wanted that uh, Takari lifecycle projects they, they should work without any changes and they should work correctly inside M2E incremental build environment, right? So we wanted to have Eclipse integration basically built right into the Takari lifecycle. Or actually our goal was a little bit wider. We wanted to build infrastructure and libraries and support tools necessary for other Maven plugins to be able to work inside M2 without any changes. Right? And also basically easier to maintain, right? Maybe it's uh, a little bit of case of not invented here, but if you ever looked at uh, any of standard Maven plugins, you will see that there are so many of uh, legacy code there and so many layers of indirection that basically before you, uh, sorry, between 
Maven compiler plugin definition in your POM, <coughs> right? And actual Java C invocation, there are like three or four layers of code that you really don't need, right? Because it's just compile invocation in the end. So idempotency, potency, well, I, I already covered that. That basically we want to be able to get byte to byte identical output. And uh, this, this includes pretty much everything, right? So your class files that compiled, right? Uh, your resources, the jar file that is created as the output of the project build. Right? Ideally, we would like to see that timestamps inside the jar are the same as the ones that were created the previous time, which is tricky, actually. Right, and so there are some resources, for example, if you happen to generate properties files as part of your build, like properties, class tends to create this funny header that uh, I, I'm puzzled why they did that, right? But problem is, like, it seems straightforward and intuitive that if you check out sources, you should get exactly the same output no matter where you build those sources. But unfortunately, this is not the case, right? Oftentimes, you, you have to do some extra effort to make sure that uh, things actually are identical. So incremental build, so I already touched on this as well. So we want faster builds by basically reusing the results of the previous build. Uh, as I said, that we don't want just this to be specific to our Takari lifecycle. We want to provide tools and libraries other Maven plugins can use. So we are developing Takari incremental build library. That basically works by tracking project inputs, outputs, relations among inputs and outputs. And by tracking this information, we are able to determine what's changed and what needs to be updated. And uh, so we clean up any stale outputs, right? So for example, if uh, you had nested class inside your Java source and that nested class was uh, removed at source level, Right, we know how to clean up the the class file that was pr produced during the previous build, and likewise we record build messages. So if you had compiler error or whatever error in the previous build and didn't make any changes to correct the error, we will just replace the error message error message. So you will get exactly the same output, or at least pretty close. Any questions so far? Uh, well, so as far as I know, Java C actually does not do any tracking. Okay. So JDT compiler does, right? And uh, I will cover on Java incremental Java compilation in my okay. second part of the talk. But as far as I know, Java C doesn't do any tracking. Okay. So these are just list of goals that we have implemented so far. Right. So if you know Maven, that this may mean something to you, but it's more like technical detail. All right, so that was it about the overview of uh, Takari Lifecycle, what it does and uh, why we did it. So if there are no questions about the Takari Lifecycle overall, I will just go straight to uh, incremental Java compiler. Yes? So is it safe, like at this point, to just drop it in and like, is it is it production ready, something you can try, or is this still? So we are using it for production purposes for a customer, <coughs> right? Very large code base, I think like 30 million lines of code, like 1,000 modules, or close to that. All our projects that we build, we use our life cycle. So I think it's production ready. So if I it's not, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's not a drop in replacement right? some changes you will have to make just like different group IDs we have made some changes to the way we configure the plugins right so because instead of having seven or so plugins in the standard lifecycle implementation there is just one 
And so some adjustments, adjustments that you will have to make, but I believe it's production ready, yes. Any I other? I have a general question. Has anybody here tried this Mercari lifecycle? No. And the other one is, how much of the uh, features or the reason for using Takari has to do with uh, the speed of compilation or recompiling, rebuilding your project, and how much of it has to do with uh, predictability or, let's say, consistency? That's it. So I cannot say that standard implementation produces inconsistent results. I think standard implementation it does pr produce consistent results. And so, but there are use cases that we were not able to support with standard uh, lifecycle implementation. Like one of them is incremental build. And so when you have thir 30 million lines of code, it really is important that if you change just one file, uh, just that one file is rebuilt, or at least as fewer files are recompiled and as fewer jar files are created. And also, item potency is important to us because the deployment size like, is really in hundreds of megabytes for each build, and that code base gets built like every few minutes. Right, there is a new build that comes. Uh, through the build pipeline. Right, so if we were deploying the entire payload at each build, during each build, right, it it just just impractical really. Out of curiosity, you have thirty million lines, how long does that take to build? <laughs> <laughs> so without deployment, right, so I mostly work remotely, so for me deploying anything is extremely long procedure, about 15-20 minutes. But it's heavily multi-threaded build, right? So we get, you know, large... Actually, no, that's not true. 20 minutes is on a MacBook. It's faster on a Linux de desktop. Test coverage? No test, sorry. No, j j just built. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, th that code base has really thorough test coverage. It takes hours to run the test on, on really no huge machines. So, any other questions about the life cycle overall? Right. So let's just go quickly through uh, Java C limitations. To the best of my knowledge, there is no fine-grained uh, type reference information that compiler produces that can be persisted from one build to the next and can be used to determine the smallest subset of files to rebuild during the next build. So really it's an uh, all or nothing affair. If single Java source changed in your project, if single dependency changed or in your project, even like single class file in any of your dependency changed, the only guaranteed way to produce correct output is to rebuild everything. Right? I do not believe there is any other way to do this with Java C. Another limitation is that Java C doesn't provide uh, support for class path access rules. So if you did any OSGI development in Eclipse, you probably know that Eclipse also lets you control what packages are visible to your consumers or not, right? So this is not possible to correctly implement with Java C. So it is possible to approximate, but correct implementation I do not believe is possible. So again, based on my experience with this uh, 30 million line code base, Java C requires significantly more memory than uh, Eclipse GDT compiler. So with Java C we have to have basically 8 gigs of RAM or our build fails without of memory exceptions. With GDT we can go with three gigs and it works just fine. And also, I don't know if this is me or something special with what I do, I am not able to actually run the build in debugger or under profiler if I'm using Java C. It just becomes unbelievably slow. A build that normally takes five minutes takes over an hour. I don't have a good explanation to this one. It's just an observation. What operating system are you using for these builds? Uh, OSX and Linux. 
No Windows, sorry. <laughs> I mean Linux. I mean, Linux is not the way. Sorry? <laughs> Linux, isn't that the way we should be doing Java development? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what we end up ended up doing, we basically took Eclipse GDT compiler that we know, right? It was developed in incre with incremental build in mind. It scales really well inside Eclipse. And we created a brand new Maven co uh, plugin compiler implementation that wraps Java C. And uh, so, <coughs> compared to standard B, uh, Maven compiler plugin, right? So our compiler implementation. So we decided that we didn't want Groovy and we didn't want Ruby and we didn't want to support any other language inside our compiler but Java. And for r the reason for that is not that we have anything against Ruby, for example. Right? It's just, if you look at compiler implementation code, the code overlap, like the amount of code they share among the compilers, is, is next to trivial. Right? Because really, what compiler does, it takes your inputs, it takes configuration options, and then it does its magic. Right? And uh, for reasons that I really don't understand, Maven compiler implementation, this, it has this Plexus compiler like adapter layer between Maven land and actual compiler implementation. And the uh, amount of complexity they had to build in this Plexus compiler layer to support all possible compilers is just unbelievable. And the gain, I, I, I honestly don't know what they gained other than basically using the same compiler plugin to be able to do what? I just made no sense, no sense to me. This is why we decided that we, we just focus on Java, we focus on what we do, and if somebody wants to do Scala or Groovy or whatever other languages you may want to do, right? So you will have to create new Maven compiler pl uh, plugin that is specific to your language. So we've added to our compiler, we've added class path access rules. So it is possible to declare what packages your components export and consumers of your components, they will get either, sorry, they, they can get compilation errors if you try to, if they try to use classes from packages that are not declared as public API. So thoroughly unit tested, I guess all our code is, right? And uh, it's mostly compatible at configuration level. So compiler is mostly drop-in replacement. We've made so some changes around, for example, uh, annotation processing configuration, we, we made it explicit, for example, but most projects, if uh, you don't do anyth anything fancy in your pom.xml file, you can just replace standard compiler plugin with Takarik lifecycle plugin and it, it will just work. Or you will get explicit error message. So incremental compilation, as I said, the idea is that because JDT compiler it gives very detailed information about class file dependencies or other references, we are able to deter deter detect and determine what is the smallest subset of files that need to be recompiled. And so there is important con concept of structural and non-structural class changes. For example, if you change method implementation, you just need to re recompile this source file and you didn't need to pro don't need to propagate the change to uh, classes that references reference this source. But if you are changing public API of your methods or you're introducing yeah. your fields, get you get this do domain, oh, at least can get this domain effect that when you compile one source, you need to recompile everything that referenced this source and this change can actually propagate quite, quite far. 
also new to our compiler implementation that we are able to handle class path changes incrementally and even GDT compiler inside Eclipse doesn't do this. If there is class path change inside the Eclipse projects, entire project get, are rebuilt, all projects are rebuilt, or at least all affected projects are rebuilt, uh, we, we d detect the smaller subset. We really compare previous version of class path with current version of class path, find what classes changed and what kind of change it was, and we do incremental build based on this smallest possible data, uh, delta. And also we replay all messages. Right? So this is just correct compi uh, incremental build behavior. If your build produced error messages last time you ran it, it should produce the same messages next time you run it. What about the case where the public static final values get baked into other compiled process? It is tracked by GDT compiler right? and it will propagate as needed. And we have unit tests to probe it. So class path access rules, as I mentioned, this is a new feature that is uh, specific to our uh, compiler implementation. We provide our own simple descriptor format that is created automatically for you if you use Takara lifecycle for your project that basically if you have packages that have input or internal as part of package name this will be considered non-exported, everything else is considered exported. And consumers of your project artifacts, they can enable access role enforcement and this will make sure that th they only use classes that you consider public API and will not be able to use stuff that you consider internal and possibly change more freely. And the reason we introduced this feature is because Maven Core itself, there is no concept of internal or public API really. And uh, because Maven is so popular, there are so many plugins that it pretty much is impossible to change without breaking something. So every change we really have to make and then listen carefully to, for user feedback and more or less roll it back because there is almost certainly a plugin or two that use that, that class that you wanted to, to change in an incompatible way. And uh, so this will be a recurring term that every feature that we introduce in Takara Lifecycle will have corresponding M2 Eclipse support. So when we introduced class path access rules, we had to go back to M2 Eclipse integration look there and one of the implications for example is that Eclipse doesn't support multiple class path for each workspace project so because of that there is only one set of access rules each project can have in Maven as well and you cannot have for example different access rules for your test classes and your main classes no. Unfortunate, but parity between common line and, and ED is very important to us. We don't want to have features that, or rather builds that work on common line, but don't work inside Eclipse and vi vice versa. So performance, well, so Takari lifecycle compiler implementation is very fast when it uses a JDT compiler backend. It's pretty, I didn't do any scientific measurement, but like just using my wristwatch, it was probably 20-25% faster than using Java C compiler. And uh, we had to do some tricks that uh, <coughs> allowed us to use this compiler efficiently in multi-threaded builds. For example, standard way GDT compiler deals with class path it was not multi-thread safe, so we had to pr implement our own what they call naming environment implementation that you can use efficiently in multi-threaded environment. Yes? Are those, are those things you're doing in the JDT go, like being pushed back into the Eclipse? So <coughs> are these things that are like uh, 
changes to JDT itself or just implementing interfaces that JDT has to? JDT provides interfaces that we implement. We didn't have to make any changes to JDT compiler, so we don't have anything pu to push yet. Oh, okay. They, they already have to support ID and common line build. And so they already went through this exercise. They have already introduced all the interfaces they needed to support these two build environments. We are just providing an alternative implementation of the interfaces they, they had for common line build. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, it, GDT uses significantly less memory, just like twice or like more than twice as less, uh, less memory than Java C. Yeah, so why do you see such a big memory? Sorry? Uh, why do you see such a big memory improvement? Well, so I have no visibility into Java C implementation, so I cannot really tell. It just, if I use Java C backend, I get out of memory errors. If I use JDT, it works. So it's empirical. So outstanding issues. We don't have proper annotation processing support for JDT. And this actually goes back to GDT compiler itself and G annotation process in GSR. You simply cannot do correct incremental build to using current annotation process and API in some cases. There is some like, disparity between how you configure GDT compiler and how you configure J Java C compiler. So they don't agree on all compiler options. And there are many more compiler options that JDT understands that Java C doesn't understand, so we don't really know what to do about that yet, because ideally we would like a compiler choice to be just single configuration change in your pom.xml file, and everything else we would like to work the same, but it, it is not currently possible, and sort of similar problem is JDT compiler produces a lot more error messages and warning messages compared to Java C. Right. So we need to figure out how to make the two uh, behave in comparable way. So any questions about compiler? Does, does the Takari lifecycle change anything about how snapshot builds work? Is the, like when you're doing uh, continuous deployment, you kind of go through and you got a multi-module project and then you build each one and at the end you, like this snapshot always kind of doesn't quite work. You want to do just a counter, build one, two, three. Yeah, that's on our to-do list. Okay. So we don't support this yet, but we, we know the problem and we, we are going to, to address this. I'm uh, just curious if you've done, if you attempted to use this with uh, a project using Takari with something like IntelliJ or and what happens? So IntelliJ, I believe it just works because integration between IntelliJ and your build tool is ra rather slim. Yep. I, I haven't heard about in, uh, NetBeans. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, so I wanted to do a demo. I don't know if uh, yeah. demos are good. All right, so I, I will show actually our development environment for Maven itself and Maven plugins that we use. It is based on uh, Eclipse, M2 Eclipse, and some of additional tools that we have implemented to support our development use cases. And. Uh, Really, there are three things that I wanted to show, is that uh, this n idea of uh, in-situ development, and the idea is basically that when you sit inside, you, sorry, when you work inside your IDE, you don't want to drop into your command line build, of course, but you also don't want to keep creating uh, those jar files or something that you then need to deploy and uh, do anything special before you are able to use it. The main goal here is that when you are inside your Eclipse environment, Eclipse creates class files 
as soon as you hit Control S or Command S on your IDE. So in situ means that we reuse these files as is where they are. We don't need to copy them anywhere to be able to to run our code in debug or run our tests. And this applies, sorry, this started as Eclipse feature, but this applies to command line build as well. So when you work on command line in Maven, normally you want, you have to, not you want to, but you have to install your artifacts into your local repository before you are able to use them. So the tools and the libraries that we've implemented to, to help us develop Maven plugins, let us not do that. Right? Let us run our tests against classes that are in target classes directory. Right? Nothing to deploy, nothing to install. So does yeah. that mean that you don't like that works when I depend on a project, which depends on a project. Yes. Yes. Clapping for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and funny thing that the first time I've implemented this idea was in nine, sorry, in two thousand two, I think, and it was my attempt at JBoss uh, development tools. All right, and uh, so there are a couple of Maven-specific Eclipse launch configuration types that we've implemented. And also there is something that I tentatively call a Java agent-based source code lookup. All right, so this is the case that, uh, sorry, this is the diagram that highlights that question that you had. Right? So when you run an integration test for your Maven plugin, so what happens really you have your plugin built or Eclipse IDE, right? The next slide talks about that. This plugin builds, compile the main plugins classes, compiles the test, then it sorry. Then it starts test GVM. And this test GVM it locates required Maven runtime and it starts this required Maven runtime. And this Maven runtime, it starts to build the test project, and as part of this test project build, it needs to go back into your original plugin build and get artifacts, or at least classes, produces, produced by your like outmost build. And does it make sense to everyone, or it's just too confusing? The, the point here is that there are several layers of indirection, and at each of these layers, there is a possibility that your tool performs uh, dependency resolution. And dependencies, they can come from external repositories, but they can also come from the output build. Outer, sorry, not out, outer build. And the libraries and the tools that we have, they fully support this use case. So question, so does this imply that now it's much easier to have like a, an SRC test IT for integration tests that's separate from your unit tests directly? Because in the past, we, we'd run into this problem whereby, let's say I have two modules that depend on each other, and I have, you know, writing tests that, that depend on that module means that I have to have a some sort of test helpers that are only needed during testing, mm -hmm. integration tests. So you end up with having to either take that module and make module A and module A test helpers, and then and then you'd have like you put your integration tests in the same directory as your unit tests. Does this help solve that problem to mm -hmm. have more flexibility with that? Well, it gives you more flexibility, right? It doesn't really solve the problem because you still have test level dependencies between your modules, right? You still need to do something about it. But but I thought you said earlier that in the Takari lifecycle you're forcing one class path the way Eclipse has it instead of a separate test path, a class path that's separate from the compiled class path. No, we are not forcing that on common line, no. Oh, okay, okay. So we just had to do some concessions to Eclipse environment and okay. we, we do not allow separate class path access rules. Okay. But uh, we do not mix main and test classes during command line build. And just to highlight similarity between Eclipse built environment and command line built environment, basically it's the, sorry, it's the same diagram, I just made some changes in one place. Right? 
but it really is the same use case when you run integration tests from Eclipse. Eclipse already compiled the test classes and main classes. Right? Eclipse starts new GVM to run the tests, and this GVM may need to go back to your Eclipse workspace and re uh, resolve dependencies from there. And it's like everything is pretty much the same. And funny thing actually is that you can like, chain multiple builds like one after another. So the longest chain I had is for testing of the testing hardness itself. Right? So I have integration tests for testing integration test hardness, which compiles the integration test hardness, then it starts integra integration tests for the integration test hardness, which compiles a test project, which happens to be a Maven plugin that uses the test hardness. And, <laughs> and it, it's really amazing how you can debug everything from your Eclipse IDE. Right, and be able to put breakpoints anywhere in this you know, long chain of things that call each other and like, see what happens and be able to make changes. And uh, the, the turnaround is just amazingly faster compared to your normal uh, flow where you have to install every single piece that you have to test. Well, so what we normally do, we do not fork separate process. We create uh, like isolated class loader that yeah. loads Maven runtime in the same GVM. But this is we do this to enable breakpoints. If you don't want to put breakpoints, you can fork Maven GVM. Okay. New Maven GVM and dependency resolution will still work. You're running the plugin builds that could probably like create new class files or something. New class files, new. Al Actually, I have a demo. I can show okay. it. Okay. <laughs> no, that's real code base. All right. So this is my workspace that I've created for this presentation, and so this is a plugin that I've created. It's it's a sample project I've published on my GitHub account like ages ago and uh, it has a sample <coughs> let me just make it a little sorry oh, okay. and so it has a very simple uh, module that creates an output file and that's all it does and file is called sample.txt and uh, there is a test project on the test projects that uh, uses this <coughs> module. Okay. And uh, I guess most of you will, will know what this means, right? So I basically tell Maven build to run this module. And uh, this is the AT that uh, integration tests that runs this build. And what I do here, I just run as Maven Junior test and unless I messed up it, it will it will work. And as you can see it runs this test against two versions of Maven. Because at least for us compatibility with like as many versions of Maven as possible is important. And the only way to ensure compatibility is to run your tests. And uh, so, if you look what is created as part of this build, uh, let me refresh. So this sample txt file is created. And like I said, you can put breakpoints pretty much anywhere, right? You can put breakpoints in the test itself. Or you can put a breakpoint in uh, your test module. Sorry, not test module, but your production code. I already happen to have a breakpoint there. And 
we are there, right? And uh, you can actually look around and put breakpoints in, in Maven itself. And I don't know if you have noticed, but my workspace does have a version of Maven, but it's another version, it's a different version of Maven. Right, what happened there is that our testing harness, it uh, look at the test uh, annotation and test annotation says that I, I, I need to be run with Maven 305 and Maven 325, I think. Right? And the testing harness went to remote repositories and downloaded needed version of Maven, versions of Maven and started to run the tests against all the versions that are specified in the annotation. And, uh, but debugger, as you can see, right? Eclipse really doesn't know what version of Maven the test runs because it's, it's specified in the source code of, of the test. But the tooling that we have, and this part, sorry, this is implemented in what I, in what I call this Java agent-based uh, source code lookup solution. So what happened there is that Eclipse talked to the test GVM and test GVM essentially told Eclipse location of either jar file of, or class path entry that was used to lo locate this, uh, the class that is currently being executed. And using this location information, we are able to, well, we have some heuristic basically to figure out sources that correspond to this class file. And this, this is far more precise compared to what you can do using standard Eclipse source lookup solution because there you need to know all your sources up front. And in case of integration tests, for example, there will be multiple versions of, of Maven running in the same GVM. So no way static code, the source code lookup can tell what uh, version of Maven is currently being executed at this breakpoint. And uh, I guess we're getting close to the end of the demo because there isn't much else to show that basically every, everything pretty much works as expected. <coughs> you are able to debug end-to-end -end through your entire code base any changes that you make to your plugins or tests, they take effect immediately without any further actions on your part. And any questions? Is there any effect on existing UTD plugins or so it's a current or something? Uh, what kind of effect? Like, so let's say Amazon, for instance, right? So you, you know, make a modification to your grammar so M2 plugins they do not need to change because M2 integrates with individual Maven plugins yeah. it really doesn't care about this life cycle as such sure. right and in case of antler I don't I actually don't know if there is a good incremental build support for antler no magic sorry <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So just to confirm, there is no associated Takari Eclipse plugin, right? just the standard M2E plugin is going to uh, do this, uh, right? There is. There are extensions. You should probably show the Takari jar how you, how you create a plugin, a project, show a Java project using Takari lifecycle. Yeah, well, right, right. So there are uh, what Fred reminds me to, to explain that Takari lifecycle it currently defines two packaging types. One is called Takari jar is, and it is used to create plain jar files. 
and the other is called Takari Maven plugin for creation of Maven plugins using our lifecycle. And so when you import either of these two packaging uh, sorry, projects into Eclipse and you don't already have Takari extensions to Eclipse installed, you go through standard M2E extension discovery mechanism. Right, so M2E will go to and check uh, extension catalog and will offer you installation of additional plugins. So it's, it, this all is pretty much seamless. Any questions? D did they answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever given any thought to distributed builds? So, for instance, years and years ago, like when I worked at a company that just did C++, um, our builds, I think the source code was something like 6 million lines of C++ with this very static libraries and all this. It, it, the static libraries essentially cause the same kind of problems that you're talking about, um, where you change one static library and like, all of a sudden there would be this whole swath of population that would have to happen. It could take up to four hours for the build to actually complete. Um, and so they ended up uh, buying this third-party product called Incredibuild, where it actually distributed out the source code to different people's machines and it could be compiling and then bringing the results back uh, to uh, the, the machine to be doing the compilation. And it drops from four hours down to about 30 minutes. Like it was significant. I'm just wondering if you've ever given any consideration to that. Well, so I think for just pure build part of it, Java compiler is way faster than C++. Sure, oh, absolutely. Right, and uh, modern hardware, you can really get, you know, you just get more CPUs. Yeah. And one of Maven extensions that we provide is called Smart Builder, that lets you take advantage of multiple CPUs that you have in your build system, and schedules the build more optimally. But uh, when distributed build may be useful is for running tests, especially if your tests require starting application server or servers if you have to, to talk to multiple servers. Uh, this is where it gets interesting, but we don't have anything yet. Other questions? All right, so the last slide I'm supposed to show is this one, is that if you want to try it, it's all available already from Maven Central repository. You just need to replace your standard lifecycle implementation with Takari one. The version is slightly outdated. We have more recent version, but it is the same. And so you change packaging type of your project and you add this uh, XML snippet in your parent form that tells Maven to use different, sorry, that defines additional lifecycle. That's it. Do you need to make any changes in your configuration? Well, so you need to have Takari M2 extensions installed, and if you don't, you will get you know regular error markers that you need to install them, and uh, and you will have to run configuration updates as you do whenever you ch you make significant changes to your project configuration. But beyond that, no special configuration, no. So is, is Takari just this project, or is it a company? Like it, it is a company. So we, we are working on next generation of development tools and build tools. And of course, next generation is subjective, but. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so are, you, are you planning anything like the equivalent of the Gradle wrapper for Maven? Like, is it, is, do you guys have like a roadmap of cool new things you'd like to see added to Maven that you can tell us about publicly? Or is it just kind of? Well, so we are making changes to Maven. I am Maven committer. Jason Van Zyl, he is the father of Maven, if you like, and he is on Maven PMC. And we, we add new features to Maven like all the time, like 
most recent features that feature that we've added is uh, dynamic discovery of uh, core extensions and the reason I mentioned that for example you said you like Ruby a lot right <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, there is the, the, somebody implemented a Ruby like syntax for defining your project models, right? So instead of using XML to define your POM, POM project model, you use a little bit of Ruby to to do that, right? and. <coughs> These new chain extensions that we've introduced in, in Maven let you have normal Maven behavior, but express your project configuration using Ruby. And I think there is another, like there are se several languages that we support. It was developed. It's pretty old set of extensions that we we developed. I actually don't know who wrote them originally. I know there is Ruby version, there is Groovy version, there is Atom version. And few other versions, uh, sorry, flavors. Scala. Probably. Mm, no. I, I'm comfortable with XML, so I don't really understand why people <laughs> like to change for the sake of change, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't really have a roadmap other than you know, high level goals is that we are working towards continuous delivery and continuous release, right? But we just, you know, solve immediate set of problems before we get to the next one. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>